Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Talking about experiencing the presence of His glory, uh, ministering along the lines of being in the presence of God. We talked about three uh, main passages of Scripture. If, if there's a small of water that somebody can find somewhere, the machines tore up out there. So... They owe me money from that. Hadn't been back in three, two weeks. They owe me $2. I went to get a Gatorade, and the thing took all my money. I even borrowed money, and it kept taking it. So, hallelujah. We're talking about, you know, the three, three major passages. Isaiah, uh, where in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train, the train of his glory filled the temple. Then we talked about Moses seeing the burning bush and going into the presence of God. Then we talked about uh, Paul on the road to Damascus how that, uh, the, he, a light shone from heaven brighter than the noonday sun. All three of these events took people who were in three different places out of the will of God and brought them into the purposes of God. Moses was too arrogant. He was out of the will of God. His arrogance made him out of the will of God. Isaiah was too self-abased. So you can't be used if you're too self-abased. Amen? So he was out of the will of God. God had to raise him up. Paul was going around just killing folk. He's out of the will of God. All right? All three of them experienced the glory. All three of them had encounters in the realm of the Spirit. And all three of them, after their encounter in the Spirit, brought them into the place where they were usable by God. All right? And so we're talking about the need to be in the presence of God and in the purposes of God. Amen. Then we talked about how Daddy Seymour uh, from the Azusa Street prophesied about 100 years ago, actually from, Azusa Street Act was lasted from around 1906 to about 1910. Now think about this. During that three, three and a half year period, people came from all over the world to get baptized in the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. Now they had to take from Europe, they would take ocean liners or, sh or ships from Europe to America and go by train to California just to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I said just to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Because there was a revival going on. They were coming from all that. And miracles, signs, and wonders. Um, uh, Janie's got that book, and she, she shared it with the children in the children's church over a season one time. But they, tell, they told me their stories. Of uh, this man who went back in the 50s and talked to the children from Azusa Street, who were now adults, what they saw. The things they saw in the Azusa Street revival. I mean, one man had little tumors all over his face, and they just all fell off with fresh new skin, and they were all over the floor, all these tumors. They just fell off his face. I mean, all, Daddy Seymour put a bag over his head because he couldn't look at the people. Don't know if he had stage fright or if it just messed him up. The, he, he would put a bag over his head and minister that way. But people, and they, and they ran continuously for over three years services every day, I think multiple services during the day and at night, people coming from all over the world just to experience the power of the glory and be filled with the Holy Ghost. That, isn't that wonderful? I said, isn't that wonderful? See, God is good. Somebody say all the time. Hallelujah. Amen. God's power transforms humanity. And being filled with the Holy Spirit is something that should be ongoing in the church. Not only, you know, you can say, well, I got it. Well, you may have gotten it, but you need to keep it. You need to stay full. Amen? Now, I have at my house a tea pitcher. In my, thank you, Jeff. Is that for me? Oh, Lord, how would you get to that cold? Glory to God. That is cold glory. Is that Garrett's? <laughs> you found your car. You all right. I have to find you some ice cream. All right. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so, you know, I got a tea pitcher in there, and we drink it. You know, I'm not going in and pull it and pour, pour it in there. Actually, I just retired my old cobalt blue rubber made one that's about 15, 20 years old. That replaced the one that was before that that was 10 or 15 years old. And, and Nathan came and sat at the table last night or yesterday and said, have we, have we retired the cobalt blue? Because I got a new clear or lime green rubber made. You know, we have, that one's retired, buddy. 
It's been in the refrigerator for a long time. But, you know, go in there and drink. You know, drink. Guess what happens if I keep drinking? It's going to run out. If I keep using what's in there, it's going to run out. And so what do we do? We make more. We fill it back up. Why? Because I want to be able to go partake. I want to partake when it's convenient, whenever I want it. And I'll tell you, there's nothing more frustrating than going there and get the picture and somebody put it back in there empty. I had my dad, my, my grandmother made my dad when he was uh, uh, late, before, right before teenage, right 10, 12, 13, somewhere right in that age, made a great big old banana pudding, you know, and put it in the refrigerator and said, now, Bobby, eat all you want. Just put the bowl back in the refrigerator when you get done. She got home that night. There was an empty bowl in the refrigerator. <laughs> she said, why is this in here? You said to put it back in there when I got done. He ate the whole thing. Hallelujah. Amen. I got, anyway, you know, when, if you're going to drink, if you're going to drink, if I should pour my tea all day long and drink it and don't make another pitcher, I'm out and no more to, to partake of. And if we, if we just keep not staying full of the Holy Ghost, there's nothing to partake of. We, we de deplete ourselves of the power and the anointing to be able to do the things God called us to do. So what we need to do, we need to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Not just get filled. You know, I grew up classical Pentecostal. And, you know, boy, I tell you, when you got the baptism, that was it. You got your red badge of courage. I mean, you were done. I mean, you have it. I got it. I got the baptism. Woo, glory to God. It became part of your testimony on Wednesday nights. I want to thank the Lord that I'm saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost. Pray for me that I hold true to the end. Glory to God. That's how, that was our testimony service. Until I, I, I got listening to Brother Cope and Brother Hagin, I messed up the testimony service. You mess with tradition, people get upset. I want to thank God I'm saved. Hallelujah. Do you know, praise God, filled with the Holy Ghost, and I'm going through to the end. Anybody want to come with me? That just messes up the whole, Who's that old young whippers? I've had the baptism 30 years. Yeah, you ain't prayed in tongues since. We need to stay full of the Holy Ghost. Can you say amen? amen. But Daddy Seymour prophesied and said there were coming in about 100 years, another century, there's going to be another Azusa Street revival. Now, let me say, it's happening in other parts of the world. It hadn't, it hadn't hit America again yet. Because we've gotten, we've gotten complacent, we've gotten lethargic, and we've gotten content living in, living in the, in the, listen, living in the smoke instead of the fire. Now, if you ever sat around a campfire, the, getting in the smoke's no fun. You know the old saying, oh, you know, smoke follows the ugly people, and everybody's moving around the fire, because that smoke keeps coming around following them. You know? Well, God don't like ugly, so stay out of the smoke and get in the fire. You know, it's wonderful to get up there by a campfire and get up next to heat and, just, and the smoke's not coming all over you. You, got the heat, you get the benefit of that heat. We need to be in the fire, not in the smoke. Stop being content being in the smoke. Stop being content not being in the fire. Amen? I mean, so it's, it's time for us to move up. And then we talked about last week how the, the command of the church is to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So, supernatural soul winning. It's not just enough, as we're saying. To be full of the Holy Ghost, we must stay full. Jude one twenty says, but, be ye, but ye, beloved, build up yourself on your most holy faith. What? Praying in the Holy Ghost. That does not mean fervent prayer. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, you'll find out. He just, uh, uh, Paul says, I'll pray in the Spirit, and I'll uh, pray in the understanding. If I, speak in, if I pray in the Spirit, my understanding is unfruitful. Why? You don't understand what you're saying. So prayer in the Spirit is praying in tongues. I said, pray, hey, praying in spirits, praying in tongues. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So let's look now at Ephesians chapter 5, and let's move through this. Hallelujah. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. We're, we're, now, we're talk, now talking about staying in the, in the presence of God, staying full of the Holy Ghost. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus says, See then that you walk, well, let me, maybe I left off something there I shouldn't have left off. You know, Paul wrote to the church of Philippi, too. But that's not where we're supposed to read from. That's where I am. He says here, verse 14, Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. We got to, listen, the church has got to wake up. I said the church has got to wake up. We're busy about trying to make homosexuals be part of the church family without repenting. 
We're busy about, you know, you know, wanting to marry homosexual couples and have homosexual priests and do all these crazy things instead of waking up. We're busy trying to have Christlamic services where the Muslims and the Christians get together in the same church service, you know, because they worship the same God. No, you don't. Allah comes from a Greek goddess, which the other name for her is Ishtar. Right. The god of, of fertility. Go back and study history, you'll find that out. That's where Allah comes from, the name. All right? And we're busy trying to have Christlamic services. We've been lulled to sleep. We've been lulled into political correctness, and it's crept into the church. Instead of being on fire with God, we're in the smoke, can't see clearly. Have you ever been around a campfire and the smoke got in your eyes? You can't see clearly. You get up, you run, you got your hand over your eyes, you're trying to get the smoke out. I mean, it's no fun. Then you've got to take a bath before you go to bed, because I can't. Even in Boy Scouts, I couldn't stand that smell of smoke while you're trying to go to sleep. You know, I'd have to go to the bathhouse and get a shot. I couldn't take that. If you're out in the woods, you just couldn't. You know, there nothing you could do. Um, but if you were in a campground, boy, we bathhouse. I can't stand that smell. Trying to sleep. It smells like a house that just burned down. God, well, God doesn't want us living like we're, our house just got burned down. Are you here? But the church is playing games. We're trying to be political. We're trying to, you know, we're trying to be, be liked by everybody. We're trying to tell everybody, that we, we're, the, uh, listen, a majority of the church is becoming universalist. Everybody's going to heaven, doesn't matter what you do. We, we can't do that. We've got to be on fire for God. And so Paul writes to the church and says, oh, you know, awake thou that sleepest. It's time to wake up, church. I said it's time to wake up. It's time to get back after it. It's time to be fervent for the things of God. You got people now who don't want to come. Listen, people tell you that, well, I don't go to churches that have Sunday night services. And we don't right now only because we can't. Garrett would have to stay here another two, two extra hours every, every week. He don't want to do that. I don't blame him. You know, he's, he's actually being gracious to come and open up for us on Sunday mornings. We, I mean, we're appreciative of that. But we'd have to pay someone else another two hours on Sunday nights and pay for the rooms on Sunday nights. And it's just not, it, we can't do it. Now, well, get, get into our own building again. Probably going to be back on Sunday night services. I've enjoyed not having them. Hey, yeah, yeah. I don't go to church on Wednesdays. I don't go to church on Sunday. I go to church on Sunday morning. And I remember the day when you first got saved and got baptized of the Holy Ghost. Couldn't keep you out of the building. There early, stayed late. I mean, all fired up about the service. Now, now they come late, leave early, and go hang out in the bathroom. You've lost your fire. And the reason you've lost your fire is you're not in the presence. You're not staying in His glory. Amen? I said you're not staying in His glory. You get back into the glory, the fire will be rekindled. Amen. I said, you get back in the glory, the fire will be rekindled. And, you know, I can't fire illustration again. You get wood on there, and it starts to go out. You either get, you got to get some more. you got to do something to stir that back up. What do you do? You put wind on it. If you've got a bellows, you go. <laughs> if you're really cute, you go get the yard blower. and. Whee! <laughs> no, you don't. You had the whole neighborhood on fire. But you get back, you, you have to stoke that fire. And see, God's wind of His Spirit will blow across the coals of your soul and rekindle that fire. Copeland has something, I will remind you to stir up the gift, rekindle the flame, fanning the fire. It's the power, you know. That, that, that old song from in His Presence album. That's an old album. Brother Bill has it, I'm sure. Yes, he does. All right. I got it. I got the CD. Hallelujah. Amen. I would remind you, stir up the gift. Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, stir it up. Stir up your gift. Why? Because the flame is going out. Each one of you are gifted in some arena for God. Each one of you are called of God. But you know, you've got to get, you, you have to stir it up. I said, you've got to stir it up. The fire doesn't stir itself up. Can't fire. It'll go out. It'll ember right out, but if you put the right amount of wind on it, right amount of flame, keep it, keep it, you know, stir, stoke it, stir it up, it'll flame back up. Yeah. And then what do you do? You put more wood on it. You stoke it and you resupply. You rekindle. You re resupply the fire. God wants us to resupply our fire of our life. 
He wants a church that's not a drudgery. Church is a joy. The, man, the psalmist said, I was glad. He didn't say I was mad. He didn't say I was sad. He said, I was glad when they said, let us go up into the house of the Lord. Yeah. Now, the charismatics, we charismatics, word of faith people came along and go, well, I'm the house of the Lord. And we, what we did, we shot ourselves in the foot trying to be smart Alex. Yeah, we're the house of the Lord. But you study the New Testament, and the word for church is used both of the individual as being the church of God and the corporate people coming together and meeting as the church of God. It's used both ways. So don't come in here and go, I'm the church, I don't need that. No, 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 no. It's used as the corporate whole meeting together also, not just you individually. See, we take one scripture and forget to get all the other ones in there and run off the deep end with stuff. Because we think we want to prove to everybody we know something they don't know. See, you know what you know that don't, somebody else don't know? Not much. We, start, we need to stop being cute and be on fire. We need to stop trying to be smarter than everybody else and have something nobody else knows and be on fire. Stop coming up with some word that some preacher used that makes you look like you're super spiritual intelligent and be on fire. I remember when I was out on vacation one time, they had a guest speaker coming to the church we were in, and he preached on the Mary Most. We came back, and all everybody was saying, have you heard of the Mary Most? Have you heard of the Mary Most? I don't even remember what the thing meant, but it was a Greek word that meant something. And all they could talk about was the Mary Most. Well, that did, what does it mean? That's the Mary Most. Well, I don't give a rip. What is it? How's that going to help me? Have you heard of the Mary Most? Well, church, we need to be on fire. We need to rekindle the flame. We need to stir ourselves up in the Holy Ghost. Amen? I said amen. So we're, 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 to be, um, we're, to not, we're to wake up, rise from the dead. Get out of that stupor. Get out of your stupor. You don't know what I've been through. Oh, my God, I know. Every one of us has a story. We all got a story. I got a story. You got a story. Everybody's got a story. But it's time to shake yourself off. Can I get a holy grunt? I said it's time to shake yourself off. It's time to wake up. It's time to rise from the dead. It's time to wake up. Get out of that fog. And Paul goes on and says in the next verse, I'm sorry, awake from the dead, Christ shall give thee light. We're wanting Christ to wake us up and do stuff, and he's telling us to wake up so he can do some stuff. He want, we want him to do some stuff, and then we'll wake up. He's telling us, wake up, and he'll do some stuff. Amen? Amen. You can go to any ship in any harbor in America, and you can get the helm of that ship and turn it right all the way, left all the way, and it'll still sit in the same direction it's sitting in. Because until that ship is put into motion, it can't be steered. Hello? I said, until it's put into motion, it cannot be steered. And we keep waiting for God to do something so that, we, so that we, you know, we keep turning the wheel, waiting for God to move us, and God's saying, move, and I'll turn the wheel. Amen. Verse 15. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise. The word circumspectly comes from a word that means to walk looking around. In other words, be aware. Literally, walk strictly. Now, one of the things that we've come up with in the, from the charismatic teach, renewal teaching revival is I'm free. Freedom. I mean, I know it's a second or something. That's how, we, that's how we live. I'm free. You know, I got liberty. I'm free in Christ. You are free in Christ to serve Christ. You are not free in Christ to do whatever you want to do. You were made free from the, he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. To do what? To follow after God. Not to go out and do what you want to do. Man is a subordinate being. Man is a subordinate spirit being. Man can either serve God or the devil. He cannot live out there by himself. Man's eternal destination is heaven or hell. He cannot go to his own place. So we are subordinate beings. It is captivity and bondage to serve the devil. So Christ has made us free. But he made us free 
from the authority of Satan so we can serve and live with God. We're still subordinate. That, wait, wait, see, you're not, you can't do your own will and do what you want to do and expect God to bless it. People preach, they're preaching now. I, you know, I don't have to give and God's still going to prosper me financially. Really? Did you ever read what Paul wrote to the church at Corinth? He that sows sparingly shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. Every man as he, purpose of, uh, as he, as he uh, purposes in his own heart. Like the guy I heard on the radio one day said, some folks send $10, some folks send $20, some folks send $30, and some folks send nothing. As the scripture saith, nothing from nothing leaveth nothing. I ain't found that scripture yet, but he's right about one thing. You sow nothing, you get nothing. You know that, that grace teaching where it says, you know, I don't have to give, I don't have to tithe, I don't have to do this, God's still going to prosper. It's like going out in your yard and standing there going, where's my corn? Did you plant corn? Nope. But I'm under grace. I get a corn harvest whether I plant corn or not. No, you don't. Oh, yeah, because I'm under grace. God does it for me no matter what I do. Nope. You don't sow, you don't reap. I said, you don't sow, you don't reap. So we're to walk strictly. We're to walk in adherence with what God tells us to do. God has commands. God has dictates. <clears throat> God said, hey, listen, I am telling you, you will not prosper if you don't sow. I just don't believe that. Well, you're getting exactly what you're sowing. Nothing. Hello? Now, for the past two years, we haven't planted our garden. And basically, our garden considered collard plants. That's all we, that's all we planted was mainly collards. Well, a couple years ago you did, but mainly collards. I got to have them collards. Yeah, a lot of collards. Guess what I don't have in my yard? Because that ain't plant. Collards. Got one. We got one that some bird must have eaten the seed or something and dropped it, left it over or whatever. Got, got acorn. It's about that tall, so it ain't doing real good. Because the rabbits keep coming and getting on hold. They like collards too. If I want to harvest, I'm going to have to sow some seed. In other words, if I, if I want what God want, has for me, I have to do what God says for me. I have to sow the seeds of obedience to God. No. See, people, people, people preaching stupid stuff. Don't want people to feel bad. Don't want people to feel like they're not measuring up. Listen, the Word of God is given as a guide and a dictate. And if we're not measuring up, we make adjustments. It's not to make you feel bad. It's to tell you what you're doing wrong so you can fix it. Every man knows this. You always try to do it first, and then you get the manual. <laughs> when you can't figure it out. And the manual's there, so that when you can't figure it out, it tells you how to do it. Well, we got a manual. And if you're not getting answers, you're not getting where you need to be, get the manual out and find out how to do it. And it'll tell you, stop doing this and start doing that. It's not to make you feel bad, it's to help you fix it. Amen. I even like the ones that tell you, we sent extra parts. <laughs> Why? Because we always have extra parts, don't we, guys? No matter what you take apart, you got stuff left over. Where'd that come from? Oh, well, Dick's got a box. I saw it. It's got all these screws and nuts and, and bolts and stuff left over from stuff through his life. It's organized, but it's still like every other guy. You got leftover stuff. Then you get the manual out. Ever put it together and had to take the whole thing back apart because you did something way down in the beginning wrong? Start here. There are commands in here. They're not there to mess you up. They're there so you don't have to get down the road and go back and undo everything and start over. Amen. So you walk strictly, walk in accordance with God's word, his will. Not as fools, but as wise. The word not as fools comes from a Greek structure that means this. Stop becoming fools. What does it mean? Too many Christians start out on fire for God, cool off, and they start becoming foolish. 
they start looking for preachers who tell them what they want to hear so they don't have to make any adjustments because they've gotten cold. They've gotten lackadaisical. They're content with the status quo. There's no fire anymore. Like I said, used to come early, stay late. Now they come late, leave early. Hello. Are y'all here? You're going home. Always on fire for the Lord. Enjoyed the message. Now they can't wait till it's over so they can get to the restaurant. They want to make sure they get their natural food more than they get their necessary food, the, the word of God. He said, but the psalmist said, I love that. I love that word more than my necessary food. Hey, I'm having burgers after church. Baked beans with maple syrup linked sausage in the baked beans to give it a nice flavor. But you know what? It could be like Jesus. And the disciples went away to get food. When they got back, he wasn't hungry anymore. And they, Who fed him? He said, my meat is to do the will of my Father. And we need to come back to the place our meat is doing the will of God. We're just on fire for God. We love Jesus. We want to help people. We want to be a blessing to the church. Sleeping in is not an option anymore. Why? Because people need us. And I need what, the, what God has for me in church. You're making me feel bad. Okay. Tough. Do something about it. My, my wife, now she took... Um, in college, at East, she went to East Carolina University. She double majored in three and a half years. Computer science and mathematics. Three and a half years. Okay? And she had a, um, a um, professor, Dr. Bycock. He's from Russia. He came out of the Soviet Union. He was from Russia. Mother Russia. And she was going to get help one day because he was just teaching stuff and he was just teaching it this, and wasn't making it clear. She wasn't getting it. So she went in there, and he, he was going, but it, you know, his Russian accent, you know. And she finally says, you just make me feel so stupid. He said, would you be, rather be stupid for a moment or ignorant for a lifetime? That ticked her off. <laughs> oh, she was peeved. But guess what it made her go do? Into the book she went. And, buddy, she got it figured out. She passed his course. She didn't, make, she didn't just barely. She passed his course. Well, I mean, you, know, you have to have to make certain ones in your, your, your degree areas. She passed his course. She was like, you know, showed the ruski. <laughs> I mean, we need more preachers who are looking at you saying, would you really feel bad for a moment or, or, or not fulfill God's plan for your whole life? Yeah. Amen. You're making me feel bad. We don't, the church is not a safe speech zone. You're not a bunch of millennials out there who can't, can't handle being told you're wrong. We need to toughen up, be on fire, and say, change me, Lord. Purge me, Lord. Cleanse me, Lord. Make me better. Let me grow up and be like Christ in every area of life. Let the Word of God have such an effect on me. It's transformative. Let the Holy Ghost come on me and purge me of all this uh, that, that displeases and dishonors you so that I can walk in your purposes and your plans and do your will in the earth. Instead of trying to find a way to get around everything and just feel good about me. Because there's over 6 billion people on this planet. And over 5 billion don't know Jesus. That's a lot of people who will close their eyes and go to hell all because you didn't want to feel bad. And you wanted your safe speech zone at church where nobody could tell you that you need to shape up or ship out, that you need to be on fire and be consumed with His glory, that you need to be consumed with pursuing His will, that you need to be pushing in, that you need to stop becoming foolish and burn with the fervor of pursuing His will. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. The psalmist said, O oh God, thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. 
My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee. In a dry and thirsty land where no water is. What, to, what for? To see thy power and thy glory as I have seen in the sanctuary. Where's the cry in the church for this? Where is the cry that says, my soul is thirsty and my flesh longs to see your power and your glory? We've exchanged it for, I don't have to do this and I can still go to heaven. We're settling for the lowest common denominator. We're settling for what's in it for me, that's all I care about. Are you here? The Apostle Paul's preached, spoke to the church at Corinth, and he said this, And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came with a marketable ministry. I had the latest, coolest dress that anybody had. I had a fog show, smoke show, light show, disco ball. We sang songs that didn't offend anybody. When I came, Paul said, when I showed up, you couldn't even tell if I was a Christian or a Muslim because we didn't want to offend anybody because we don't want to be microaggressive. Chapel Hill put, published a journal, I mean a, a publication, sent it to all their staff saying don't say you're going on Christmas vacation. That is microaggression. They need to change the name to the University of Chap of Carolina, North, University of North Carolina at Berkeley because they are just UCAL Berkeley of the East Coast now. The chancellor says she will not follow the law that says men can't go into women's and women can't go into men's bathrooms. You know what I say? Then the, our state legislation needs to get together and fire her and put somebody in there that will follow the law. Paul did not say, I came with a method that makes you all happy. The Apostle Paul said this. He said, I, brethren, when I came to you, came not in excellency of speech or wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except, that word saved is except in, the, in Greek, it comes, means that. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. What's he saying? The Apostle Paul said, I came in weakness. You saw me in my worst. You saw me in my weak points. You saw me when I wasn't on the top of my game. Hallelujah. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. See, we get cute. We come up with little sermons. We come up with little stuff. We, we, we got to have you know, these, all this stuff that kind of gets people to come in with nothing to change them. We're trying to find a hook to hook humanity. But Paul said this, I did not come to you with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Glory to God. Why? Why? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men. The Apostle Paul said it is not good enough to be cute. It is not good enough to have a slick phrase. It's not good enough to have a rock climbing wall or smoke show or disco lights in the church services and call that worship. He said there must be a demonstration of the Holy Spirit and the power of God that transforms men and women and come with that. Why? Because it is the power, it is the anointing, it is the glory of God that breaks the yoke of bondage off of humanity. Not your cute little sign. Paul says, it's not enough. It's not enough. You must come. And I came demonstrating the Holy Ghost, releasing His power. And he said, it had to be this way, so that their faith would not stand in the wisdom of man. What happens when it stands in the wisdom of man? Satan is a supernatural enemy. 
with supernatural power. And your natural wisdom of men is no match. It's no match. The wisdom of man and the, the, the ideas of man are no match for what the devil brings. But I, don't get uptight. Don't worry. Because John wrote to the church and said, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Paul said, I came with the power of the Spirit, demonstration of the Spirit, so your faith would not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So that when you face the enemy, you are equipped not only to defeat, but to overcome and to occupy. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Till Jesus comes. Yeah. Glory to God. No more this Mickey Mouse junk. Church of America, wake up. We must be in the power of the Spirit. So that demons are driven out. Diseases are cured. The powers of darkness that bind the minds of men and women are broken. And the light of the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ shines into their hearts. And woos them to Christ. In the end, it's all about winning the lost. Even the blessings of God on your life are about winning the lost. Oh, glory to God. I said glory to God. The writer of Hebrews, I believe Paul, but the writer of Hebrews... Chapter 12 says, Wherefore, seeing we're compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 comes right after Hebrews 11. You know who's in Hebrews 11? Abraham and Sarah and David and, and uh, Gideon and... I don't know what I was supposed to do. That was an alarm. Anyway, maybe I was supposed to shut up. All right. And all the prophets... Are all in there, you know, they are listed either indirectly or directly? And Paul says, see, we're, we're encircled by such a great cloud of witnesses. Those who went on before. Those who sold out everything to follow after God. To do the will of God. To be the servant of God. Some it cost them their lives. Some wouldn't even receive deliverance because they didn't want to be made perfect until we were made perfect. Glory to God. I'm telling you, I mean, they were sawn asunder. They were, they were persecuted. They were you know, all kinds of stuff. Yet they would not bow. They would not back off. They would not quit. The Hebrew children, that's not in the Bible for, as it's just a story. So we can have a good Bible story. That's in there to show you you can, not, you can refuse to bow and God will deliver you. Hallelujah. David was thrown into the lion's den. Over and over and over again, things happened. But they, would not, they refused not to follow after God. They refused to quit. Not to quit. They refused, they refused quitting. They would not quit. They would not give up. They would not compromise. They would not turn their faith. They, you know, they would obey God. To honor and to please Him. And now we're, we've got the, just like the enemy's trying to creep into America and destroy America from within, Satan's trying to creep into the church and destroy the church from within. He's working on both fronts all the time, natural and spiritual. Trying to destroy America, destroy our Constitution, destroy the, the fabric of our nation. The Russians said, the communists said, they will, we will never destroy America from without, we'll destroy it from within. Satan, listen, that was a Satan-inspired statement because he won't destroy the church from without. He has to destroy it from within. He has to take our fire, take our zeal, take our purpose and substitute it with what can, what's in it for me. What's in it for me? So that all we do is we run off to our little, listen, we word of faith, and I say we, we word of faith charismatics have been the world's worst about what's in it for me. Listen, if we don't wake up and recognize that and not look and take criticism to heart and say, you know what? Some of the stuff we did has just been all about us. And you can, you can go to the church services and find out that's where you are.
What do you mean? Prosperity seminar, you'll feel the building up. Holiness seminar, you can't find anybody. And you know, the Bible does not say without prosperity, no man shall see the Lord. It says without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. That went over big. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Going home, thank you. Oh, there's no back door here. All right. You used to have a back door. I could get out there, get off the stage. I'm not against prosperity. But you've got to be holy. I said, you've got to be holy. You've got to live right before the Lord. Have a how to live right for the Lord seminar. How to live under grace and God never condemns you. See which one fills up first. Where's the fervor? Where's the fire? We're going to stir it up. I said, we're going to stir it up. I said, we're, we're summoning hearts to be stirred by the Holy Ghost. Men and women in this church right here to have a fervor for God. Saying, I will not be satisfied with the status quo. I will not be satisfied with just getting by. I will not be satisfied with just making heaven as the old, completely inaccurate term, but still a term, by the skin of my teeth. He did not say he was coming back for the church that's crippled and inept. He's coming back for the glorious church, having not spot or wrinkle. That means there's got to be a fire. It has to be an outpouring. Amen. I have a prayer cloth here. One of Cap's friends, that, um, his grandfather was just diagnosed with brain cancer, and after the testimony from Penny's neighbor, um, he started telling his friend about, his, his, uh, about that, and so the, he's going to send him a prayer cloth for his, his friend's grandfather just got diagnosed with brain cancer. God's bigger than brain cancer. And so, Father, we lay hands on this cloth. Oh, dear God, we thank you for the anointing that destroys jokes and removes burdens. We curse the cancer in this man's brain. We say as a cloth is laid on him, just like the Apostle Paul in Acts 19, 11, and 12, you wrought special miracles. People were healed. Demons went out of the people. We lay hands on this cloth now. That anointing is transferred. As it's taken to this man, we decree that anointing is released and heals it from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. And it eradicates the cancer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You, you agree with that? Amen, 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 amen. There's an expectancy stirring in our midst. We're waking up, we're rising up, as it were, from the dead. Christ shines light on us once again. And we run and then finish. Wherefore, saying great kind of witnesses, let us run our race with patience. Let us lay aside the weight and the sin that is easy to beset us. Let us run our race with patience, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Why are we looking unto Jesus? Because when we keep our eye on him, we keep our eyes off of us, number one. We can get so consumed with us, we forget about him. It's time for us to put the cheese back in the refrigerator so we don't have to have cheese with our wine. Hello? The wine and cheese crack. Everybody has to have wine, cheese with their wine. Julie's going, huh? It's time to get rid of the wine. And I'm not talking about alcohol. I'm talking about the whiny wine. Even the church music that's whiny. We need to get rid of it. I mean, stop whining already. I mean, we, we have... I know they've, they've been busy, they've been in school, they've been kind of going all different directions. We've got to learn some blood songs. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from 
Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain lose all their guilty stain lose all their guilty stain and sinners plunge beneath that flood lose all their guilty stain <clears throat> have you been to Jesus for his cleansing power are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you fully trusting in his grace this hour are you washed in the blood of the lamb are you washed in the blood in the soul cleansing blood of the lamb are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the lamb oh thank god for the blood i said thank god for the blood we trust that you were blessed by the word of god and the flow of the spirit of god in this service if you would like to contact us please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.